If you're attracted to Krishna consciousness and have begun to research into it, that is most commendable. However, you are only at the beginning of your search into achieving perfection. Specific manifestations of what appear to be Krishna conscious institutions require more than general knowledge of Vaishnavism. As you actually enter into this next and somewhat difficult layer, to merely know about the Hare Krishna movement will be seen to be not good enough. The primary manifestation or the first manifestation of the movement, so to speak, has changed from what it once was and after that it has changed in other ways. There are different brands now. These brand names are what we shall refer to them as and they will be explained. Although rivals, these cracks of deviation are force multipliers that have one thing in common. They engage in psychological manipulation of newcomers via initiation. As such, they are engaged in gaslighting both their followers and the public at large. We should all be concerned about this because in the name of Krishna, somewhat sincere people in spiritual life are having their psyches snapped in many cases, after narrowly escaping the black hole of their first contact, they react to the treatment received there by throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Psychological treatment is not brainwashing when the institution is bona fide, when it's a representative of its founder and the absolute truth. Under his perfect guidance, Prabhupada's Hare Krishna organization did represent the absolute truth. Psychological cleansing was integral to its process. However, psychological manipulation often extends for long periods of time. This was mostly not the case during Prabhupada's manifest presence, wherein he guided his movement. However, even while he was still physically present, deviation started to worm its way into the movement. That is essentially all that has gone down since he left the scene, especially after the zonal catastrophe of March 1978. In terms of the first transformation of so-called ISKCON, during its initial period of the zonals, a new devotee would automatically question the validity of his or her thoughts, presuppositions, interests, desires, and identification. Such questioning is integral to the process when it is bona fide, although whether or not progress is achieved is determined by the validity, or lack thereof, of the institution in which this new person acts. Obviously, with the dumbing down of so-called ISKCON over time, during the following periods, especially of the second transformation and the current third transformation, the brainwashing element became itself dumbed down and less intense. That was also memory hold, of course. Removing the layers of the universal matrix within entails peeling back different layers of affiliation and belief systems. As you know, our presentations cater to those who are, at bare minimum, at least interested in Vaishnavism. If you are one of those people, as you attempt to transcend Maya, you will have to confront the current manifestations of factions, all of which are only allegedly representing Vaishnavism. These are those three initiation machines. Air quotes, ISKCON, betrayal, Neomat mutiny, and Ritvik heresy. All three factions engage in massive gaslighting as to what they supposedly are 
and whether or not you are being either implicitly or explicitly brainwashed by them. They have different perceptions of reality and those misconceptions typically lead to promoting confusion, loss of self-confidence, and emotional turmoil in the unfortunates who join them after a period of initial curiosity. If you allow yourself to become dependent on any one of these emblems of the universal regulatrix, your mental and intellectual stability will be challenged. You will have to deal with a whole new set of pernicious illusions. All three of the major deviations mislead anyone who joins them, and they mislead them to their own advantage, the institution's advantage. And they do so in various ways. Some of these ways are the same in each faction, and of course, some of them are very different. Nevertheless, emotional manipulation is always integral to their tactics within the wheelhouse of their peculiar strategies. One of the most important means for transcending their influences is to understand each of these initiation machines for what they actually are and not what they advertise themselves to be. Each of the factions are exposed in this presentation and as far as that goes in every one of our presentations. However, internally, all of them also have their own in-house cracks, meaning that there are smaller splinter groups within each of the three chief factions. Mostly, these splinter groups and cracks are hidden from the general public, but our, our presentations are not meant for the Vox Populi. Back in the 19th century, before electricity, the streets of a city, such as London, for example, were lit at night by gaslights. It was better than nothing, but not much better. Little was seen clearly. There were a lot of shadows producing various illusions. The streets were dangerous due to this until electricity provided cities with massive improvement in the quality of their street lights, making general vision clearer. Gaslighting is also a psychological phenomenon. However, if you really want to understand it, the three above mentioned cults capture the essence of how it functions. Gaslighting is basically emotional manipulation producing illusory images that induce the belief that all reactions, perceptions, and memories are not just mistaken, but are actually unfounded and crazy. The three deviant cults replace all history, fact, and truth with their own dogma and absurd presuppositions, and they then gaslight their followers into believing in all of these shadows. Each of the cults demands acceptance of its dogma, achieved through besetting the intelligence of any newcomer with doubt until that intelligence snaps and acquiesces. Regimentation is also integral to the implementation of cult gaslighting. You cannot question, which means doubt, any of the cult's leaders and still remain in good standing with it. Some very small leeway is sometimes afforded in terms of questioning a preaching strategy, yet even there, you have to walk on eggshells in order to assure everyone that your criticism is only constructive to the institution. Sugar-coated with some tasty quasi-Vaishnav teachings in the name of Vaishnavism, the air quotes ISKCON movement is ultimately nothing more than another organized Western religion. It represents a semblance of a Pukti cult, but it is strongly rooted in the soil of organized religion. Cults can be destroyed comparatively easily, but organized religions cannot. They have strong connection to all three modes, whereas genuine Pukti cults do not have this. As such, organized religions survive world wars, but genuine devotional cults have little or no connection with the outside culture. As such, 
they are much more vulnerable. So-called iskan is an Eastern Kaitava Tharma, as opposed to the Malacha Tharmas, the organized religions of the West. India, as most of you know, is also loaded with Kaitava Tharmas, and so-called iskan follows in its footsteps. This particular organized religion is composed of many incorrigible party men, and their number is hard to determine because new ones are being added. Some are sannyasis, some are temple presidents, and some are members of the governing body. It's not that any of these are necessarily themselves true believers. It's their follower who is the true believer. They are the godmen, and the followers are their chelas and kikmis, conducting services which suit the godmen. The party men at the upper echelon are the individual controllers of this institution, posing as its loyal servants. In one sense, they are servants, because all conditioned souls are forced to serve something or someone. They possess some power. Indeed, as far as astral powers are concerned, they are not ordinary men. They are like the brain police, and they control almost all the other devotees in their cult, either directly or indirectly. You should not allow them to control you, however. Powerful party men have honed the ability to influence a section of the malcontents and even turn them around, usually through a combination of deception disguised as persuasion, along with various forms of threat and punishment. The party men utilize the punishment vibe, but it's mostly a bluff. They have methods to psych out those who are either opposed to them or doubting them. They are not at all experts in spiritual science, but they are experts in intimidation and the psych out. They may employ their skills on malcontents by telling them that their lost faith in the GBC is like a cracked china bowl. In effect, you cannot put a cracked china bowl back together again. You can do it, of course, but it will never look nearly as good as it originally was. In other words, it will never look the same. That's just one example of the techniques of the party man. They are experts at creating doubt and guilt, masters of deception, masters at bewilderment, experts at enticement, and masters of pseudo-persuasion, which when you boil it down is actually deception. When the situation calls for it, they dish out harassment and psychic punishment within the spheres of their influence, both growth and gross and subtle. Not all of them are expert in this black art, but the cream of the bad crop most definitely is. Their followers, almost all of whom are weak in knowledge, mind control, and yogic development, can hardly escape that institutional black hole once sucked into it. The genuine guru, who the party men imitate, is different from them. He is heavy in transcendental knowledge, and he is expert in spiritual science. As such, his persuasion is not intimidation. It is also not based upon, or even at all buttressed by, the institution he works within and makes efforts to expand. We're talking about Prabhupada here predominantly. You will not find anyone like this in today's version of so-called ISKCON. And real gurus have not been present in that organization for many decades. It is doubtful that there are even any Kanishta Adhikaris left in it. But there certainly are a plethora of Sahajiyas taking advantage of it. Some of the less deviated followers still have some flickering attachment to Prabhupada, but the air quotes ISKCON leaders of today, although they make a show of being attached to him, conclusively prove that they do not, by their words and actions, they fit the following description as stated by Prabhupada in a morning walk on December 5th, 1973, quote, throw him away, go away. I have now learned Guru Maravidya, the knowledge of how to kill a guru. 
Guru Mara Vidya. Their philosophy is that you cannot rise up. You take a ladder, but as soon as you rise, throw away the ladder. No more. No more needed. That is my avad philosophy, unquote. So-called Iskan had to adapt after the zonal acharya imposition crashed and burned in the mid-80s. That institution was floundering and being ditched by many devotees at that time. In order to keep it from cratering, its leaders adopted the tactic of centering upon Prabhupada and worship services and no longer allowing great pretenders to be worshipped in the temple rooms. They also facilitated the exposure of deviations and scandals, mostly sexual, by select pretenders, thus removing those from the list of approved gurus by the institution. You could say that the organization returned to the principle of keeping the acharya in the center. This new tactic, only a tactic, because it was not founded upon genuine love for the Acharya, was effective in combining the collegiate compromise of the mid-80s with the previous appointment of gurus, a scheme in order to keep the institution afloat. But, please note, if those leaders actually had genuine love for Prabhupada, they would have returned to square one at that time. They would have legislated and implemented the obvious. No one had actually been a genuine guru after Prabhupada departed, and as a result, all of the new people were improperly initiated. Instead, the second transformation took an unauthorized shortcut, one which required a new tactic of reinitiation allowing some of the great pretenders to remain institutional gurus at the intermediate stage, so-called, remaining in good standing with the institution. It also approved the disciples of the others, but they had to get reinitiated by those gurus who the institution now accepted. The institutional quagmire got worse Although superficially, things improved to some limited extent. The tactic of Prabhupada's centering in the mid-80s should not be overblown, as it still fit into the overall air quotes ISKCON strategy, which remained and remains anything but commendable. This same dichotomy is also found outside of so-called ISKCON. It is particularly found amongst the Ritviks, whose concocted movement, make that movements in plural because Ritvik is highly centripetal, is founded upon an anti-Vedic idea. The concoction is based upon an unauthorized principle that Prabhupada allegedly created a completely new parampara, and as a logical consequence, was the alleged founder of a brand requiring a reversal of the traditional historical perspective. And we're talking about thousands of years here. As such, to Ritviks in general, even if they take a conservative approach regarding particulars, Prabhupada is not the representative of an unbroken tradition. Instead, he has formed, according to them, a whole new sampradaya which is being implemented only by them. Ritviks like to think that they are following a higher principle. In that vein, traditional parampara need not be given any importance. Indeed, it should be disregarded. Any statement of previous acharyas that goes against Ritvik is considered irrelevant. Devotees who are actually traditionalists, who have adhered to the guru parampara, dispute this, and they all profoundly oppose Rithik, as should you. All three of the great deviations, so-called Iskan, Neomat, and Rithik, have set into motion in the last four plus decades a spiritual war. Directly only in one case is Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada has in effect 
now been put on trial. Did he actually bring a workable paradigm of devotional service to the West? The current results do not look good. Clearly, the fundamental values of his contribution have been strained by all the deviations embedded in these three great deviations. Everything is being scattered. The center is not holding and genuine Krishna consciousness is hanging by a thread. This is undeniable to any objective onlooker. Indeed, Lord Chaitanya's movement in the Western countries is in danger of being completely lost. That is not the result of expert management, is it? It is not the result of expert gurus either, but instead it's the result of bad management and bogus gurus. How important is being expert in spiritual life? It is very important. Devotees are not sentimentalists. Consider these following quotes from platform lectures by Prabhupada very early in his movement, while he was still spreading the movement more or less under his control. In a platform lecture in Los Angeles, January 12th, 1969, quote, If you want to know about spiritual master, then you must approach a spiritual master who knows things. How you can learn it from anywhere and everywhere. One must be expert in spiritual knowledge. From him you have to learn. Unquote. And from a platform lecture in Melbourne, Australia, dated April 4th, 1972, quote, So a man claiming to be in the high position, he must be expert in everything. He must be expert in everything. So therefore, a Vaishnava is called Daksha, expert, expert, unquote. Once the zonal catastrophe was implemented in the spring of 1978, is this expertise what anyone received? Were any of those pretenders expert in anything? Well, they were. They were expert in bluffing. They were expert in cheating. They were expert in deception. And what was the result of all of that? Based upon institutional imprimatur, was it anything more than creating massive initiation machines? I've just asked some questions and all of them are rhetorical. The guru must be expert. If he is also a genuine diksha guru, that demands for him to be experts at an even greater level. He must be expert in spiritual knowledge and realization. He must be expert in guiding his disciple in the right way in order for him to make tangible spiritual advancement. The guru must be expert in understanding the psychophysical nature of this disciple and thus engaging him in a way that will enthuse him, in a way that is compatible with his personality dovetailed to Seva. When the 26 qualities of a devotee are delineated, one of these is being expert. This is not referring to the Kanishta. It is referring to the Madhyam Udhikari. The Madhyam is qualified to be a spiritual master as a shiksha guru. He's qualified automatically. He is obviously a Vartma Pradarshika guru. However, in our line, he must be specifically given the order by the Acharya in order to initiate new devotees, in order to be a genuine Diksha guru. Tat pharmacy. The Diksha Guru in any genuine Sampradaya must be expert in not only the rituals of the initiation ceremony, he must take on the Sanchita Karma of his disciple also. He must be expert, powerful, and realized enough in order to do this and not descend as a result to a lower level. However, if that so-called Diksha Guru is pretending to be an Uttama Adhikari, he is already at the lowest level because he's already a Sahajya. A Sahajya is not expert in anything of spiritual or devotional value. Instead, 
He tends to be envious of anyone who is advanced in understanding and applying the spiritual science. When a neophyte enters into a spiritual institution and becomes initiated by a bona fide spiritual master, that newcomer must be careful not to offend his guru. Such offenses lead him downwards towards Sahajism. And if he reaches that level, then an evil energy can and does enter his astral body. Do not think for a moment that this was not going on even while Prabhupada was here. From a letter to Dixit, dated September 18, 1976, quote, I am practically seen that as soon as they begin to learn a little Sanskrit, immediately they feel that they have become more than their guru, and then the policy is kill guru and be killed himself, unquote. Ooh, there's a couple of major examples of that, wasn't there? So how do you think that they are the best devotees? In point of fact, they are closer to my bodies than they are to devotees. Actually, they're at the lowest rung of those who can liberally be thought of as Vaishnavs. Consider this quote about the mentality of Sahajyas. Quote, one may make a show of devotional service like the Prakrita Sahajyas, or one may try to support his philosophy by joining some caste or identifying himself with a certain dynasty, claiming a monopoly on spiritual advancement. Thus, with the support of family tradition, one may become a pseudo-guru or a so-called spiritual master, unquote. And that's from Chaitanya Charitamrita Purport. In the late 70s, there were 11 pseudo-gurus at the beginning of the first transformation. They were not deserving of worship. They all cut high profiles. They all accepted adulation from their god brothers. And they were all Sahajiyas. They were also wild cards although all of them were dependent upon the Governing Body Commission for their zones and their statuses as so-called Diksha Gurus. Most importantly, they were all covertly opposed to Prabhupada. They thought they could do better. They thought they could pull it off, but they didn't. As such, these Sahajyas were also party men. So the myriad complex was difficult to figure out. However, it has been figured out for some time, and it's been figured out by the Vaishnav Foundation, which is offering to you this presentation containing the real explanation of the pseudo-gurus of so-called ISKCON. This presentation is for your edification, protection, and realization. Identifying with so-called ISKCON means, at the core level, to self-identify with a mission that, as time rolls on, is more and more opposed to Prabhupada. This is also the case when it comes to the Ritviks and Neomad. The genuinely initiated disciples of the Sampradaya Acharya are, therefore, obliged to reaffirm their commitment to him and to his teachings, and only to him and his teachings. If you actually have this attitude, confrontation with so-called ISKCON, with its gurus, with its party men, and with all of its many deviations and splinter groups, is unavoidable. None of the, air quotes, ISKCON leaders were or are experts in terms of spiritual life, but most of them are quite pragmatic. They know the art of kicking the can down the road. They can be considered pseudo-devotional pragmatists. Time and place rationalizations underpin, in particular, both the so-called ISKCON and Ritvik deviations. Western culture is currently influencing both of these movements, big time. Although so-called ISKCON has undergone three transformations, mostly forced to do so by need for damage control, all of this has been blown off by the party men as merely growing pains. They attribute the flotsam of difficulties to be the result of personal ambition, individual pride, and immaturity in carrying out the orders of the spiritual master. Not so. 
All of these upheavals are the result of a deeper stratum. At the very core, Western attitudes and the mode of passion permeate individual conditioning within wayward disciples. The principalities and modes were already present in the leaders of so-called ISKCON far before they actuated their contribution to postmodern pandemonium. There are bogus processes underlying the deviations they have introduced, and these automatically clash with the Guru Parampara. At the heart of everything that they have done is the fact that none of those men who doled out those easy initiations was qualified to do so. Newcomers to Krishna consciousness need to confront this fact and come to grips with it. Now, if they do that, it does generate some conflict within, but there is no need to be upset about that development. That's a good development. So-called ISKCON is a cleft organization. There are two conflicting mentalities within it. One relies on pragmatism. It relies on judged by the material results, might makes right, and time plays circumstance. Any new agenda, which you can call tactic, is to be judged through this prism by that side of the cleft organization. The other bases its conclusions on a literal approach to what Prabhupada said and wrote, but these party men constitute the minority report. The first faction sees continuous innovation as the key to spreading the movement far and wide. They conveniently consider the phrase time, place, and circumstances as utilitarian. They are also prone to misuse the utility is the principal shibboleth. The traditionalists barely hanging on at this time and soon to be wiped out within that movement say that time, place, and circumstance can only be an adjustment that fits restricted short-term situations having no application in the long term. In so-called ISKCON, these Western utilitarian values are accentuated in a disguised form. The cult promotes an anti-intellectual bent that is noticeably present throughout the rank and file. Despite its sophisticated penchant for pseudo-scholasticism during the second transformation, it is not at all intellectually oriented in practice. Instead of occult realization and spiritual power through austerity, material results are the be-all and end-all as far as the party man is concerned. Utilitarian pragmatism necessi necessitates that truth is made real only by empirical or apparent verification. In other words, if the philosophy and action according to it pays off. In that philosophy, there are not universal truths that hold true in all circumstances. If any idea is proposed, that idea or innovation is made true when events show that it has become materially demonstrable as an idea that works. The party men are profoundly skeptical of any teaching, knowledge, or wisdom, even if it is received through Prabhupada's books and the Guru Parampara, if that teaching does not produce material results. The results, of course, must also accord to what they desire. As such, from this perspective, God is on the side of the biggest results. In other words, the Machiavellian dictum that the only sin is failure. Results can be made bigger in empirical reality if the idea of pragmatism is combined effectively with time, place, and circumstance compromise. Such pragmatic quote-unquote adjustments entail non-devotees giving their hard-earned money to so-called ISKCON. This approach does not combine at all with genuine Krishna consciousness. As a theory of what constitutes truth, pragmatism underlies many postmodern moral systems in the West, especially in politics and sociology. Except in rare cases, 
It rejects theistic notions of transcendence. It rejects innate universals or absolute ideas. But that's what Krishna consciousness is all about. Western pragmatism permeates and pollutes the party men, affording them the opportunity to unwittingly coalesce under its banner whenever threatened. Guru Parampara means the divine tradition. The devotees who believe in Parampara, who believe in its teachings, who believe in its injunctions, who believe in its principles, laws, and universals, can be called conservative traditionalists. Only they can actually become experts in spiritual science, not pragmatists. The postmodern stalwarts of so-called ISKCON consider the pragmatic scheme so important that it must always trump any restrictions of tradition, Guru Parampara. This means that it covertly puts Prabhupada on trial. This will invariably serve to break the Guru Parampara and reinvent a so-called tradition seeped in unauthorized Western pseudo-Vaishnavism, which would be in blatant contradiction and opposition to all the Prabhupada brought to us and taught us. Instead of being a submissive recipient of the message, now the so-called sadhaka decides for himself what is true. He decides for himself what is false, what's best, what is the higher intention in all of it. When in point of fact, whatever he comes up with is nothing more than his own flawed agenda. When a doctor prescribes medicine, he describes the prescription and the dosage. The patient is supposed to follow his directions as given. On the other hand, this new agenda of the party man allows every devotee, as long as he or she continues to pledge allegiance to so-called ISKCON, to subscribe his or her own agenda or intention in place of the tradition, as long as it does not clash with GBC policy and produce material results that are counter to what so-called ISKCON wants. In other words, it needs to produce results that are approved by so-called ISKCON. And if they are, then so-called ISKCON allows these pseudo sadikas to substitute their feelings as the paramount consideration, trumping the dictates of what Prabhupada attempted to establish. The result of this will never be creating devotees expert in spiritual science. But as we have seen, the most powerful of them have become expert in formulating initiation machines. It is all rooted in an application of Western pragmatism in the name of, quote unquote, utility is the principle. In order to achieve ephemeral, secondary, and institutional objectives with, for a good measure, the quote-unquote, time, place, and circumstance trope added to the mix. An ever-changing movement is thus irreversibly transformed on the river of no return. To say that Western civilization, which is basically Anglo-American culture, is now intrinsic to so-called Islam, so-called Iskan, is to make an understatement the philosophies that undergird Western culture have injected themselves powerfully into so-called ISKCON, and they should be seen for just what they are. On the whole, Westerners are inclined to empiricism, thinking that the reality of sensual particulars outweighs the so-called fantasy of universal truths. Air quotes ISKCON Westerners in the same vein tend to also be utilitarians. These counter-cultural leftists think that people are fundamentally good. They just need the right social environment and education in order to make them useful in consequence. In Kali Yuga Harbor, this presumption is wrong, and that has been demonstrated repeatedly. The spirit soul, of course, is all good. But the Ahankar and Svapav of Westerners is mostly evil. Vaishnava Prachara does not measure the good of any action by its so-called results. It does not consider that any course of action liable to produce degradation in the name of good results constitutes real progress 
and developing personal sattva, what to speak of shuddha sattva. Now we come to one of the zonals, and we know who this is. This was TKG. He was heavily involved in the implementation of the first transformation. And after that, he kept stretching the rubber band with more and more audacity up to his violent end. While he was a major influence, he introduced covert Mayavad into the movement, just around the time that the Hindu hodgepodge got its foot in the door. At that time, he revealed his real face. When he asked this question, quote, can our agenda be pushed further, unquote, in order to promulgate the mission to, quote, diasporic Indian congregations, quote, uh, you can read in that Hindu hodgepodge, of course, a blurring of the irreversible divide separating personalists from impersonalists was offered by TKG. He similarly concocted that although Prabhupada defined his mission in terms of the defeat of the Mayavadis, and please note, most Hindus are under Mayavad influence. Prabhupada's mission produced alienation, confusion, and offense allegedly to the above-mentioned diaspora. In effect, this former big-time zonal, along with one of his buddies, authored a paper which advocated that a pillar of Vaishnava preaching should be abandoned in the name of spreading the movement by implementing a pro-Mayavad approach into it. TKG further backed the notion of any yoga practitioner being, quote, the final arbiter, unquote, of what constitutes devotional service, uh, ye old time, place, and circumstance rationalization. In other words, his final position paper made the sadhaka the determiner of what is bona fide and what is not. It allows him, the sadhaka, to judge whether Srila Prabhupada was right or wrong on any conclusion or on any preaching strategy. And that puts Prabhupada on trial. But our verdict is that he is not guilty. Another way of saying the same thing is that you can't pin the air quotes ISKCON deviations on Prabhupada. Pin the tail on the donkey where it belongs. Pin it on the vitiated GBC and pin it on all the rascals who followed the vitiated GBC. The colossal hoax known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON confederation is a pseudo-spiritual scam. In human life on the material plane, you win some and you lose some. There is no need for this rule to apply to spiritual life, however. It is up to you to make sure that it does not, which means if you are new to the process of bhakti yoga, you need to do your homework before you go all in with any organization. You need not be victimized by any of the three initiation machines today posing as conduits to spiritual perfection, as there is no spiritual sequence following any connection to them. You will never achieve spiritual perfection by affiliating yourself with any of them. Study the history and accept nothing less than being guided by an expert devotee. And you will not find any of those in so-called ISKCON. Instead, you will find leaders who are expert in gaslighting and concocting revenue enhancement schemes as evidenced by the plain clothes pick from back in the day and the current Hindu hodgepodge compromise of the third transformation. That expertise is not what you are looking for if you are sincere and, spirit and serious in spiritual life Contact with the tattva and siddhanta that Prabhupada has made available to everyone is what should be your inclination. That is encouraged in this presentation. So understand what went down in his movement and work on attaining the knowledge of what is bona fide and bogus in carrying out devotional service which actually pleases the founder Acharya. With a combination of sincerity, seriousness, and knowledge, all you need is to add some transcendental luck and you're good to go. 
If you have been listening to and or reading this presentation, and just as importantly, if you have assimilated its clear message, then you have added that fourth item of the portfolio of transcendental luck to your spiritual folder. Avoid getting near the black hole represented by so-called ISKCON because there is a point of no return if you happen to wander in there. Sadeva Samya.